Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for this All Party Cancer Caucus. Today's meeting will be recorded via Zoom. We would like to make a land acknowledgement. We are on the traditional lands of the Treaty 4 territory, home to the Cree, Salto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and homeland of the Métis. We would like to say thank you to the Saskatchewan party for inviting us to Regina, and we look forward to working with MLAs of all parties in order to put the needs of Saskatchewan's cancer patients first and foremost. We are pleased to be joining you here for the first time in Regina. My name is Lindsay Tim, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. I'm joined by my colleague, Connor Mulders, who is our Public Policy Coordinator. Regretfully, our president and CEO, Jackie Manthorne, could not join us today and sends her regards. We will be joined today by a host of the cancer a host of cancer community representatives who I hope will provide you with a broader understanding of the topics we will be discussing today. Today's guests include Candace Skrapek, Dr. Mohammed Khan, Dr. Habib Khan, Marjorie Olson, and members of her family, and Jenny Dale who is the executive director of Dense Breast Canada. All of us are here today because we want to help what may already be an unavoidable increase in the number of deaths from cancer due to challenges of screening and early diagnosis. Together, we, can, we call on you to not wait to further invest in strengthening cancer care in the province. <clears throat> Before we begin today's presentation, we wanted to acknowledge the passing and loss of Derek Myers. From the releases being written, it is clear that a good, hardworking man was lost. Our sincerest condolences to all who knew him. As we begin, we want to congratulate Saskatchewan on the budget increase for cancer care. For this to pro provide, Oh, my apologies. I just got to do it this way, yeah, I think. Manually. There we are. For this to provide further funding for oncology drugs, additional direct support staff, as well as a $957,000 increase for the pediatric hematology oncology program is impressive. So a little bit about who we are at the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. The Canadian Cancer Survivor Network is a national network of patients, families, survivors, friends, community partners, funders, and sponsors who have come together to take action. We want to promote the very best standards of care for the whole cancer journey. Overarching objectives. We want to promote and encourage advocacy among survivors and patients, work with governments and all political parties and other decision makers to educate and promote positive and consider considered policy ideas that will result in an optimum experience for cancer patients, caregivers and survivors in the healthcare system. With empowered survivors as our advocates and partners, we bring a practical real life perspective to the, dis to the discussion. We want everyone to, have the chance to hear the lived experience of survivors. A few facts and figures. Created toward the end of 2011 by a group of cancer patient survivors and family members, we are a registered charity. The, our website was launched in June 2012. We have a medical advisory committee, several patient advisory councils, and over 50 partner groups across Canada. We have over 10,000 subscribers to our monthly newsletter. Uh, over 8,500 likes on Facebook, over 6,700 likes on, or, sorry, followers on our main Twitter feed, SurvivorNet CA. We have a blog and a growing Instagram following. Other Twitter accounts to mention are our Best Breast News, Prostate Post, Lung Cancer Canada, CCSN Poly, and Cancer Can't Wait, just to name a few of them. Cancer patient engagement through educational webinars. 
Our longstanding flagship series covers a variety of topics from emotional wellness to the drug approval process. We aim to have two webinars a month during the winter spring and also the fall and winter. Our Cancer Survivor to Financial Survivor webinar series started in 2002. It is our newest webinar series and it takes a close look at the financial burden of cancer on all and what we can do to help alleviate it. One of our other projects that we have on the go is our prostate cancer website project. It's an aggregator website to help create a one, one place for people to go to find help with prostate cancer. It is going to be largely Canadian-based information. And currently we have a patient advisory council looking over the decisions being made. For elections, CCSN asks questions of every political party and every candidate during federal and provincial elections. Some topics include timely access to cancer drugs, screening issues, gaps in services to cancer survivors, financial hardship, and issues specific to the province in question. Our Cancer Can't Wait campaign, COVID-19 Impact on Cancer Care in Canada, we have commissioned five Leger surveys on the impact of the pandemic on cancer care in Canada. You can find all, both reports covering the first four surveys on our website under the ACT section. And the results of the fifth survey on cancer and long COVID will be available soon. Our legislative receptions are a good way to inform politicians and other decision makers about issues important to patients and survivors. Pre-COVID, we we've held, held several receptions at the Ontario Legislature at Queen's Park in Toronto and issues related to cancer. The last few receptions were attended by over 100 patients, caregivers, cancer groups, MPPs, and staff, and at least one legislative reception will be held in the fall of 2023. Like today, the Ontario All-Party Cancer Caucus brings together legislators from all parties, CCSN and patients, caregivers, and survivors to discuss issues related to cancer and healthcare. Ontario's first caucus meeting was held in 2017, and they have been held twice a year since then, except for during COVID-19. Topics have included issues related to cancer rehabilitation, including pain and lymphedema, lung cancer screening, take-home cancer drugs, and prostate cancer screening. The Alberta All-Party Cancer Caucus first was held prior to the pandemic. The topics discussed were rehabilitation for cancer patients, including a presentation by a rehab specialist about why rehab is so important and on lymphedema tre treatment. A third Alberta caucus meeting will be held after the May 2023 election. The Science of Cancer course that is available on the CCSN website is available in both English and French. It has 10 modules and is designed to prepare patients, caregivers, and survivors to sit on research peer review panels. It is free to anyone is interested in taking it. And with that, I will pass them to my colleague, Connor. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Connor Mulders. I am the public policy coordinator with the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network. I uh, just want to thank everyone who's been able to attend here in person, uh, from our MLAs to our cancer uh, to our cancer patient advocates to our medical advocates as well. Uh, I would just like to also thank Lindsay. I realized that that was very difficult, and I do appreciate that you took the time to do uh, to introduce me. So uh, I will now be discussing the introduction of lung cancer screening within Saskatchewan itself. So to start off with, let's talk about lung cancer. Lung cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in Canada. Uh, an estimated 30,000 new uh, cases are diagnosed every year. Uh, and the most recent case in 2022, based on the Canadian Cancer Society's uh, statistics, from those 30,000 uh, people, 20,700 will die of lung cancer, according to the CCS. So from that, if we break it down even further by a province basis, that means 840 sets I, I do apologize. I'm probably going to mess this up. Uh, Saskatchewanians, Saskatchewan, 
one e Saskatchewan e Indians. I, I apologize. It's residents of Saskatchewan. Let's go with that. Saskat Let's just go residents of Saskatchewan so I don't screw it up. Uh, will be diagnosed with lung cancer have in 2022. And from those, 590 will die from it, according to the Canadian Cancer Society. So how do we do prevent lung cancer? Well, it's pretty simple. You catch it before it becomes a problem. So how do we do that? Low, uh, lung cancer is mostly caught using low dose computed tomo uh, tomography. I apologies for screwing up these words today. Uh, but as we, everyone knows, these better as CT scans. So lung cancer screening can be used to find lung cancer significantly early, uh, which of course gives you a better chance overall of a treatment actually working if you're trying to cure the disease. So lung cancer screening results in more lung cancers being diagnosed earlier in stages one and two, rather than in more difficult to treat stages three or four. So right now we have a map of the current regimes, although it's not 100% perfect uh, on the current uh, lung cancer screening regimes across the country. Uh, as you can see, Saskatchewan has a minor but not necessarily fully funded uh, pilot project from the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. Uh, it has no government set up or government funded uh, lung cancer screening system. Uh, from this, we have a few updates to this original map. So uh, BC has gone through and fully uh, committed and announced uh, that they are implementing a full uh, screening program uh, in the May of 2022 last year. Alberta has also updated their program and are now running the pilot program uh, out through the University of Calgary. So from that, we move over a bit more into screening. Uh, and as you can see, so British Columbia is at the moment at the peak of uh, interest, uh, the peak of uh, lung cancer screening across the country. So 36 sites across the province treating about 20,000 patients uh, a year uh, for lung cancer patients. So going further back across the country, Ontario only has four sites treating about somewhere between five and 10,000 patients a year. Quebec has seven sites, again, treating about five or 10,000 patients a year. Uh, Alberta has three, but they're mostly located in Edmonton and Calgary. Uh, and the only issue, of course, is that all these criteria are almost always limited to two very specific groups, those who are over the age of 55 and those who have a previous history of smoking. So the only problem is, is that lung cancer, while it can be affected by those factors, will strike anyone at any time. It's an unfortunate reality, but uh, lung cancer can affect anybody. It isn't just a smoker's disease, as it's known. Uh, however, a low dose CT scan diagnostic system, uh, catching these things, catching these uh, diseases at an early age uh, has been shown to increase lung cancer survival rates by over 20 years by 80%. Once again, that's the Canadian Cancer Society's numbers on these things. So we have a few uh, bits of information if anyone would like to follow up on any of your uh, provincial colleagues across the country, uh, British Columbia, Ontario, Alberta, and Quebec. Uh, but at this point, I am actually going to stop talking, uh, and I am instead going to hand things over electronically to uh, our good friend, Candice Scrapic. Candice is a stage one lung cancer survivor and a former nursing educator uh, who now works with groups such as Lung Cancer Canada and Lung Saskatchewan to raise awareness of this disease. Candice, if you could take it away. Great. Thanks, Connor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm... Um, uh, very happy to be joining you. I'm very fortunate to be joining you. And I say that, of course, with uh, deep sincerity because I am a lung cancer survivor. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge that I was born and raised in Treaty 1 territory, which is Winnipeg, uh, but spent most of my adult life here in Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6. Uh, so both are traditional territories of numerous First Nations and the homeland of of Métis, and I acknowledge my uh, relationship uh, with those uh, populations. Um, a little bit about me. Um, if you want to advance, Connor, that would be great. Um, in 2016, I was um, in the hospital being treated for another condition called idiopathic pancreatitis. Long title for um, a description of a condition that um, uh, could not be identified as what the, what the cause of it was. Um, while I was in the hospital, I needed to have an abdominal CT scan and an alert radiologist noticed uh, on that abdominal CT scan at the bottom of one of my lungs, there was a nodule. 
So while I was in hospital being treated for another condition, um, I received the news that I had uh, a nodule on my lung and it was in all likelihood um, malignant uh, and that I would have to begin uh, a process of, of uh, diagnosis. So it was sudden, uh, very unexpected. Uh, and I was, um, as I said, already being in hospital, being treated for another condition. The interesting thing is that both of these conditions, lung cancer and pancreatitis, are highly stigmatized uh, conditions. That is, they are blame the victim uh, kinds of, of um, uh, causes and uh, but the uh, my kids will tell you I'm not really a party animal so I'm I don't drink so that was not a reason for my pancreatitis um, and I quit smoking probably 40 years ago so and I had not smoked very much at all so that blame the victim um, became um, part of uh, my awareness of the issues that face lung cancer, um, uh, the, uh, lung cancer um, patients. Um, and the other part of it was being told how lucky I was, um, which was a bit of an oxymoron to me because um, I really did not consider myself to be lucky that I was diagnosed with cancer. But I'm certainly aware how fortunate I was uh, to be diagnosed early. Um, I um, went through the process of diagno diagnostic testing. Uh, I had um, surgery through what's called a VATS procedure uh, to remove one of the lobes of my uh, lungs, uh, and then went through a period of recovery and uh, surveillance uh, over a five-year period. Um, since that time, I have been fortunate and I, um, uh, I have not had any further uh, symptoms um, and uh, or evidence of lung cancer. So it has reinforced for me really uh, how critical lung cancer screening and early detection is for long-term survival of cancer patients. So um, Connor, you can just advance, I think. Uh, as Connor said, lung cancer is one of the most commonly diagnosed cancers. Uh, it um, takes more lives than breast, prostate, and colorectal cancer. Um, it is uh, most likely cause of cancer-related death and one of the most difficult diagnoses that patients can receive because of its uh, history of, of poor outcome. So what's the difference? Um, the, the, according to uh, Lung Cancer Canada, uh, about 78 people are diagnosed with lung cancer each day in Canada. Uh, that's now actually up to about 82, but at the time that um, I got the, the numbers, it was 78. Um, and about, uh, of those, about 58 die from lung cancer each day. 72 people are diagnosed with breast cancer each day. So about a comparable number, but 14 people die from breast cancer each day. So what's the difference? Why is there such a discrepancy between the number of people diagnosed and the number of people that survive? So the next slide, Connor. Um, it really uh, boils down to um, early detection uh, through uh, screening programs. And uh, lung cancer, um, currently, there are, are, although, as Connor mentioned, there are kind of a smattering of some lung cancer detection programs across the country, uh, despite uh, screening guidelines, um, international screening guidelines, there is no well established uh, screening program uh, in Saskatchewan. And um, uh, as with many other jurisdictions, um, there, um, there is no program that is comparable uh, to the breast cancer and colon, and, and colon screening 
uh, kinds of programs that uh, currently exist in the country. And so because of that, there will continue to be an unnecessary burden on those who are, are diagnosed uh, in late stages. So how can we reduce the lung cancer incidence and burden? Uh, first of all, through uh, activities like this, which is uh, prevention and advocacy, raising awareness generally about the incidence of lung cancer. Um, and uh, when I talk about education awareness, I'm not talking just about education of the public, although the public need to understand better about how they can uh, be diagnosed uh, in earlier stages, but also um, healthcare providers uh, need better education and awareness about uh, early detection and uh, screening referral. The other piece, uh, certainly in Saskatchewan, is rate on detection. There's a very high incidence of lung cancer that is related to uh, radon in Saskatchewan, uh, and we need to do a better job of uh, education around that. Um, battling stigma and indifference and um, uh, trying to achieve a more accurate diagnosis uh, is critical. Uh, and we've talked about the, the lung screening guidelines. Uh, biomarker testing is one that is evolving uh, and uh, will continue to improve over time. So the next slide. Again, reducing the incidence and burden is through improved treatment with better health outcomes. We see evolving through um, research, the advancements in immunotherapy, in the biomarker testing and targeted drug therapy, which is having uh, great success with certain types of lung cancer. Um, other types of treatments like high precision radiation and robotic surgery, uh, but uh, meaningful public involvement, including um, yourselves, uh, and engagement with us as patients and our families uh, is a critical um, uh, element uh, to that uh, reduction of incidence and burden. So it's my hope that uh, early screening to detect lung cancer will become uh, accessible and affordable and a best practice in all Canadian jurisdictions, but certainly uh, here in Saskatchewan. Uh, so I will pass that on now, Connor, back to you. Thank you very much for your very strong words, Candice. Uh, so at this point, I would like to invite up Dr. Mohamed, uh, I do apologize, Mohamed Imtiaz Khan. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, he is a trained in Pakistan at the Ayub Medical College, uh, moved to the UK in 2004, where he studied both in Glasgow and in London. He's a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of London. Uh, he worked at a regional heart and lung center while he was there. Uh, he then moved to Saskatchewan about six years ago and is currently a medical oncologist at the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency, as well as an associate professor of medicine at University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Dr. Khan will be speaking about lung cancer screening in the province. Dr. Khan. So first of all, thank you very much, uh, everyone, and especially the um, Canadian Cancer Survival Network for giving me an opportunity to speak uh, to you all here. And uh, also, I'd like to offer my condolences for passing away of De Derek Meyer, one of your dearest colleagues, and one of uh, very... Uh, brave patient, I must say. Um, so my focus today is uh, on lung cancer. I treat lung cancer as well as breast cancer besides other cancers. Um, my focus today is on lung cancer. And um, uh, I was asked to speak about how we can improve cancer care in Saskatchewan. So um, Candice and Connor has already made my job very easier by giving you a background on lung cancer, but just a few things more to mention that it is one of the more, most uh, common cancers and is leading cause of uh, cancer death in Canada. Survival, as uh, Candice has mentioned earlier, the earlier it is diagnosed, the better survival rate, the uh, stage one 70% falls down to 5% if it is diagnosed late in stage four. Um, Canadian cancer statistics say that half of the lung cancer cases in Canada are stage four uh, eight diagnosis and three, four of symptomatic patients are in advanced stage, meaning stage three or four. I must say in Saskatchewan, our experience is 
more than half of the patients are diagnosed at a later stage, uh, stage four or so. And that again, we they say is one of the opportunities how we can discuss about improvement in that. Early diagnosis uh, and treatment saves lives. Um, so early stage, just give you a bird's eye view of what treatments, um, how we treat them. Early stage surgery and radiothera radiotherapy are the mainstay of treatment. In advanced stage, there are a variety of combination of treatments, chemo radiotherapy, chemotherapy, target therapy, immunotherapy, or a combination of that. It is obviously much more complex and complicated than that, but um, just for simplified reasons, uh, that was an overview. Now, I would like to, uh, um, uh, the rest of my talk is going to be about two different categories of patients. One is asymptomatic patients, and the other one is symptomatic patient. As uh, Candace mentioned, she was uh, asymptomatic. Um, she, was, she, she was diagnosed because of some other reason. Uh, she presented to the hospital and was diagnosed with lung cancer. This is what we call incidental diagnosis. And um, often these patients have undergone a chest X-ray before undergoing some surgery or um, had a fall, shoulder X-ray leading to chest lesion um, or showing up on the, on the um, X-ray and leading to further investigations, which finds lung cancer. The other way we, find, we can find lung cancer in early stage is screening. Uh, and that's uh, what we'll be talking about uh, uh, first. And then my later part of the talk is going to focus on symptomatic patients. So these are the patients who have shortness of breath, who have cough, um, uh, bringing blood in the sputum, weight loss, or presenting with uh, symptoms of pain. And we'll be talking about how we can actually diagnose them more efficiently and quickly and, and start them on treatment more promptly. So the first, this is now asymptomatic uh, uh, patients, how we can do that. Lung cancer screening is an important part of that diagnosis. Obviously, incidental diagnosis, you are lucky if you get a chest X-ray or some other investigation for a different reason. But the other way of actively looking out for diagnosing these patients at an early stage is, is uh, lung cancer screening. And these were the two um, big trials that demonstrated the value of lung cancer screening in, redu in reducing mortality rates in high-risk populations. Um, if we look at the bottom uh, part of this table, uh, you can see that the number needed to screen, uh, that is 320 for lung cancer, which has remained the same since it was introduced in 2015. And, uh, and um, uh, it is uh, still the same when the uptake is much more higher from 5.5%. 5.9% to 55% uh, in, in, uh, in the uh, jurisdiction, jurisdictions where it is uh, available. If we compare that to breast cancer screening, actually the number needed to screen or the patients who need to undergo mammography or ultrasound scan is more than double of, of this. Similarly for cervical cancer and colon cancer, which also have screening programs, their number needed to screen is much more higher, four times than what will be for the lung cancer screening. Lung cancer screening, uh, different places have adopted different um, uh, ways of how to, to approach this. One is risk factor approach uh, in which the age and uh, smoking history, as was mentioned earlier, are the mainstay of targeting the high risk populations. And the other one is risk prediction models, which look at much broader aspect of spectrum because these are all in some way related to higher incidence of breast cancer. And that comes up with a score and then uh, that's how they predict or more specifically target the, the, the uh, people in uh, to screen. Um, the number needed to treat or number needed to screen that we use in medical terminology is, uh, as I mentioned to you, it's, um, it's already um, uh, much lower than what will be for detecting breast, uh, the breast cancer or cervical or colon cancer. Uh, cost effectiveness, uh, we can discuss about that and harms of screening uh, as well, because obviously false positives or complications from the screening or biopsy and things like that after you diagnosed a nodule that, it, that may not be lung cancer. So um, what is 
uh, what it involves mainly it's a low dose CT scan. Um, it improves the detection of stage one cancer to 65%. Uh, we can detect them much more early, uh, a much more early stage. Uh, it is a low dose as the, man man as the name mentions. So 20% of the normal CT exposure dose is, is what it is. And it is obviously much shorter time to do the scan. Um, it is uh, from the studies, uh, uh, economic analysis, co cost effectiveness is uh, highly varied, 15 to 20,000 uh, dollars per quality of life year gained uh, from the lung cancer screening. This chart, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's projecting here. So it is, uh, it, this is from the Canadian Partnership uh, uh, Against Cancer um, uh, website. This slide is taken from them. And this is where the screening program has already started, like BC pilot program in, um, in uh, uh, Quebec and uh, uh, Ontario. And uh, Alberta, obviously, Saskatchewan. We are, as mentioned, we are having a screening program, not yet started, but it is it is in the phases of uh, of uh, very initial workup. So pre implementation planning activities have begun. Um, uh, these include continued stakeholder engagement using established col uh, collaboration and frameworks. Uh, governance and shared decision-making models are being developed, uh, completion of full business case and analysis of lung cancer screening, and determination, uh, uh, determine, determination of operational and technology requirements as to uh, coordinate between the uh, radiation, uh, radiology, uh, pathology departments, and all uh, that, and co-development of implementation plan using logic models, evaluation frameworks, and quality indicators. Now, this is very much, as I said, in the, uh, the project itself, we have been hearing about it for two to three years now. Um, I did check with the team who deals with it. Um, there is no implementation date in the near, in the near uh, future, but obviously some background working, uh, work is in progress. They are, uh, discussing, they are in discussions with the different stakeholders, which include primary care physicians, radi uh, radiology departments, and, uh, and other uh, stakeholders, which are the key components of this. So um, this was uh, about screening. Now, focusing on the second part of my discussion, which is very uh, close to my heart, and I feel that will improve um, uh, uh, improve the outcomes for a lot of patients that we see here. And that is the symptomatic patient. The asymptomatic ones, early stage, incidental diagnosis and screening, but these symptomatic ones, we'll look into what they have to go through before they get the diagnosis and how their treatment pathway works. So if we look at this um, a diagram, somebody with symptom, this is now they may be short of breath or cough or any of the symptoms, they First of all, they wait to see their family, they wait to see for a couple of weeks before their cough will settle down. They will see whether this is improving or not. Then they will go and see their family physician or where the family physicians in the rural community here are not available, their nurse practitioner. They will prescribe them a course of antibiotics thinking that it might be a simple infection and he's having cough from this. Um, uh, he will take the antibiotics, it will not settle down. Um, it, they may request a chest x-ray, see, is there something that we are missing? Chest x-ray may show some changes. The radiologist may report it, maybe infection, maybe something else. Let's give another course of antibiotics uh, and repeat the chest x-ray if these changes resolve. Again, this all process is taking weeks because every time this is going through a step, it is taking more time. Repeat chest x-ray shows still abnormal. They, the GP gets the report of the chest X-ray. Okay, it is still abnormal. They refer them to a chest physician. Chest physician, again, patient is waiting for the appointment, is seen afterwards. They think it might be a cancer. They request a CT scan. Again, there is a waiting time for CT scan. The CT scan happens. It does confirm, yes, there is some abnormality. Let's biopsy it. Again, there's a waiting time for biopsy. And then the biopsy or bronchoscopy sometime, uh, they may, um, depending upon where the lesion is, the bronchoscopy, again, it takes a week or so for the biopsy to, uh, 
to be reported. Again, it goes back to the uh, uh, specialist. They look at it, they refer it to cancer clinic. In the cancer clinic, we also um, may need more tasks. For example, a full CT of the rest of the abdomen and pelvis, CT of brain, their lung function to see how good or bad their lung function is, depending upon how high dose radiation or something we are planning to administer. Um, and we will see them. Again, this takes time before they actually start treatment. So you actually have seen that this cycle from their symptoms to, to being diagnosed and actually getting treatment is, is, is very uh, cumbersome. Uh, in a patient whose cancer is already actively uh, is symptomatic, they are, they are not only their cancer is growing, but actually their burden of symptom is increasing. This slide I've taken from the Canadian Partnership Against uh, Cancer. Uh, it's one of their slides, and uh, they, this describes the rapid diagnosis for lung cancer initiatives in Canada. So if we can see that Saskatchewan is the only province besides uh, 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 Nunavut and Northern Territories and New Brunswick to not have any such initiative. So that is why I feel this is one of the very important uh, aspects of this patient journey that we set up some services for the rapid diagnosis of lung cancer uh, patients. We call it rapid access lung cancer clinic. Um, this is basically a one window operation. Somebody is having symptoms, is GP has treatment not resolved. They come and they see um, uh, a, a physician who decides straight away rather than back and forth between, between different investigations, uh, CT and either biopsy or, or um, bronchoscopy to achieve a rapid diagnosis. And basically that we can talk about uh, how logistically that can be achieved, but we have seen that actually in cases that I worked before, this window can be reduced to two weeks, depending upon where you start counting the time from. But this long journey of, of different steps can be minimized to even a very shorter interval. So it is helpful for the patient uh, and self-referral can also uh, come through that. It is good for the patient, early diagnosis resulting in better outcomes. We know that if we diagnose it early before the patient is much more symptomatic or much more weaker, during going through this journey, if we see them at a time when he is, is not that weak, we can treat them uh, better and it has better results. Uh, obviously, the initial setup resource is, is going to be um, resource consuming. It will need resources to actually set up some sort of this model. But in the longer time, if we look at once we have set up, this is already the same healthcare model that this patient will need to be to have the CT scan, but at a later time. Now we are trying to do the same scan at much earlier time, the same biopsy, but much more quickly, the same appointment for the oncologist, but much more quickly. So we can shorten their, their diagnostic journey uh, uh, to much uh, shorter time. And I must say that this, this type of initiative, this is achievable in a very short uh, time frame, provided that it is adequately resourced and adequately um, supported. Uh, this is not something we are talking about many years down the line. This is something we can certainly do in, in maybe in a year if, if, if somebody pays a proper attention to it and, uh, and really is on the go. So these were uh, my two um, areas that I wanted to focus on. I thank you all uh, for allowing me the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'll be available for questions later on, if any. Thank you very much. I pass on to Paul. Uh, so I would now like to up, uh, invite up the other Dr. Khan, uh, this time Dr. Mohammed Habib Khan. Uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, Habib Khan was UK trained. He, he worked both at the University Hospital of Birmingham, the Royal Marsden Hospital, and as well as the Leeds Teaching Hospital, all within the uh, National Health System, National Health Service, my apologies. <laughs> uh, he's a fellow of College of Physicians and Surgeons and Royal College of Radiologists in London. Uh, he holds a master's degree in clinical oncology from the University of Birmingham. And he's currently the provincial lead in Saskatchewan for urological cancers and an associate professor for medical oncology at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Khan will be speaking on improved breast and prostate cancer screening. Dr. Khan.
Thank you, Connors. Um, as you heard, I'm Dr. Khan. Uh, honorable members of the Saskatchewan Legislature, la ladies, gentlemen, and friends, many thanks for inviting me to talk about uh, breast and prostate cancer here, and it's an honor to be here. So my talk outlines introduction about the cancer care, patient challenges, challenges faced by the physicians as well, because they are part of this uh, community who helps patients. Breast and prostate cancer care in Regina, I'm gonna have a quick view. And then in conclusion, cancer care is a significant issue and we have to address that by cancer screening programs, uh, which play a crucial role in early detection and improve outcomes. Cancer care in Regina continues to evolve, meet the needs of the community. I acknowledge the hard work put in by every healthcare worker here. Healthcare system is based on screening and in Regina, we already have breast cancer screening, colorectal screening and cervical cancer screening. So these are the important things that we are covered and lung cancer screening has just been addressed now. In terms of cancer care services, which is an essential part which leads up to after the diagnosis, includes multidisciplinary care teams, which include radiation services, chemotherapy services, surgical services, palliative care services. These are the essential part of the journey of a patient care. So these all are very essential and we have to make sure that we provide enough support and funds to them. And after that, supportive care services, which are also essential for our working. This importance of early detection is very high. So if we call through the patient navigation system, these are the people who are at the telephone. When you ring, they pick up the phone and answers your call and let you know what to do. They direct you towards the right people to help you guys. So these are also, they coordinate the care and also direct you towards the education, resources, and emotional support that can be provided to you or the patients. So what are the challenges faced by the patients? We have heard about the pathways, how complicated they can be. We heard about the challenges that we face at the diagnosis, not only by the physicians, but the patients and all the people who are involved around them as well. It's about the family. It's not one person who's affected. So timely diagnosis, just imagine a patient who found a lump. He has to wait for about days to go and see a physician. And after that, going to waiting for another scan to happen. And these are, I've come across quite a few people when I sit in the clinic, when they tell me their stories, it is hard. Heartbreak, heartbreaking. So what can we do to assess these kind of thing? And by the time they come to me, they are all worn out and just waiting to see as quickly as possible once they've diagnosed. So we have to assess to specialized care, make it as quicker as possible. And that can be a one-stop clinic or rapid clinic that we're talking about. Then we talk about supportive care services. So I go there, I tell them about the cancer. I tell, tell, them, tell them about the treatment. I tell them about the side effects. Then I disappear. So what happened to them? So what would happen to them? It is a supportive care which comes afterwards as well. So I come, sometimes they ask my nurses, I come back to them. So all these things are getting more complicated day by day. Patient education awareness, that's what I'm talking about. The main thing is we need to make sure that people are aware. I say to my patients that if you don't know what to expect, it would be difficult for me to say. And if you don't tell me, I can't act. So if they don't know about what symptoms to look out for or what complication to look out for, it will be very difficult. And that makes an essential point for us to educate the patient and the staff and other things. Second thing we find is not only the education for the patients and the surrounding other people, it's all the healthcare workers as well, which are working. So people who are working in the emergency department may not be as aware of few things that we need to teach them. So we have to go back and teach other people and our uh, colleagues as well. And then it all comes with a financial burden. It's not easy to find play time and resources to do all these stuff. So we have to make sure that these things are put in. And addressing these challenges requires a multidisciplinary approach. So it's not only me, I cannot make a difference. It's you, everybody, patient, education, healthcare workers, are all policymakers and community organization like this, which makes a difference. So what are the challenges faced by the physician care? So here comes the barge of new treatments are uh, being uh, found every day, every year, every month, and we are piling up. Just when I started my cancer career, there were only four or five drugs, and I remember them, and they were used on most of the cancers. Now we got thousands and thousands of drugs. 
not only just because they are treating same, it's becoming more individualized and personalized care. So we have to look when it comes to it, when you want to provide the quality, you have to invest time in it. When you invest time, you get a better outcome. Numbers may make a difference, but obviously we have to expand uh, on all directions to make sure we can cater for all the people. Management of treatment and side effects is a complex issue. Anybody who has looked after or a patient who's going for the cancer treatment has its complex uh, side effects and management of them are very, very uh, complex as well. And it takes time. Sometimes you can overcome the side effects. Sometimes they are lifelong and they live with it. And whenever we talk about long-term side effects, we don't have any clinic looking after the people who come for the like with these kind of symptoms. This is a physical signs I'm talking about. The emotional trauma they go through, it cannot be explained by any words to me. And increasing demand care and limited resources are always a challenge. I can understand we cannot provide all the money, but we can invest time. At least we can acknowledge and try to work towards the best outcome. So what are the challenges of care in Regina or in Saskatchewan in general we're gonna talk about? We all know about the limited access to family physician and specialist physician. Everybody is trying to work hard. And it is not it just we have to work around on all grounds, training more physicians, uh, attracting them over here, and try to make sure that we retain them, providing them enough kind of uh, material and resources so they can work. Sometimes people can feel quite uh, frustrated if you don't have hands-on or if you work in a better environment when you come here, you want to create something. That's what you give back where you're coming to. You try to invest into the local community where you are, try to improve the services and try to make a difference. And that's what our piece is for our life that our achievement is called. And this is smile on my patient face. That's what gives me the return. And second is lack of patient awareness and support. We have to make sure that we educate our patients. It's not only about educating the patient, it's about the population as well. So they can support them. It's not a taboo anymore. It is one of the things, one of the chronic disease, I call them. Any disease, even if you are diagnosed early, you're cured. You live your life, go back to the community, pay back. Second thing is if you're living with the terminal illness or palliative treatment that you're having, even though I tell people like in the previous old days, people used to have TB and other chronic diseases were, were taken at the same one. But now we got cured for that. And they can be a very productive member of the society, even though they have very advanced disease and they can maintain their quality of life now with the availability of the newer treatment. And all this comes with more investing time and for the physicians to look through all these new tests coming up and God knows how many things are there that we have to look in the future as well. So one thing has been mentioned about the rapid assess clinic. Similarly in the breast, we can use one-stop diagnostic breast clinic it will benefit in people in Regina. That's what my thing said. When I see a young patient coming with a breast lump, I've been going around for her appointments and coming to me quite late with a very large tumor. It is things. Sometimes I come across fungating tumors. You cannot even imagine how heartbreaking it is to see the patient were waiting for so long just to get through. Or some of them are not only just because delay, it is about the education as well. We have to make sure the people present early. The earlier you present, it's better to treat. That's why I tell everybody, not only about these things, the longer you can leave, it's more problematic it will become. So we have to enhance, improve the patient satisfaction as well. So make sure that they are given the chance. They have the confidence when they're gonna call, they're gonna get a better answer. I've been on the phone waiting for hours just to get an appointment or get through to a doctor. And I'm just wanting to get an appointment early for my patient. And that's what we have to come up with. So we have to enhance coordination of care between different specialties. We find, okay, I'm an oncologist. I can see a patient. I can try to work extra hours or something, whatever. But if they are not having the right investigations available, I won't be able to make a decision. So these are the key things that we have to look into and improve the patient outcomes. If you got all the information in front of me, the better decision will be made. If I have a half information, I will make the half decision and I have to postpone something, wait for the other things to happen. So we have to improve the patient outcome by ensuring prompt diagnosis and treatment. The other things that we are trying hard to get in Saskatchewan, which was there, and we, by the help of our couple of colleagues, have made some progress in it. So is a PSMA PET scan. It's a very complex name. What is, so we got CT scan, which looks at the more 3D 
uh, or two-dimensional look inside the body. Then we got metabolic scan. These are the highly isotope scans which given into the body, taken up by the cancer cells, they light up. So we can identify the tumor better. And simple, I give you some example in the next slide. And then when we identify and locate the cancer tissue, we can make a plan more accurately and precisely. If some of the tumor, if they are only located in one area, we can chuck them out. We can then target the radiotherapies, the stereotactic radiotherapy. There are so many things that we can do, but you can only see one lot in the lung and there might be other hidden somewhere else. Then going after that one would not make a sense. Then you have to treat the whole body. That means the systemic treatment comes or the advanced disease that comes. So that would help us identify these things. Detecting prostate cancer at an early stage. So sometimes you get a scan, you get a gray area, how to identify those. So you got your bond or based like everyday standard test. Then you always, always get a gray area that we need a test that would identify and help me to get the treatment on. If I don't have the test to err on the safer side, that's the motive most of the people would take in that uh, situation. So what we can do and targeting that area, once we identify that's the cancer I need to identify, I can target more accurately with a diagnostic needle, taking a sample out, knowing about the cancer, sending for genetic information or DNA for information, then I can give them more precise kind of treatment or tailored treatment, which will help them uh, and leaving them out to have unnecessary toxicity from the standard kind of treatment. And it also helps in monitoring the disease progress. So once we're given the treatment, are they still there, gone away? It makes it quite a bit of a drift uh, impact on my decision. So if somebody has a locally advanced disease and I give treatment, it goes away. That would be more radical in terms of taking the cancer out with the surgery, making sure they have more of the treatment, make sure it does not come back and they can go back. If I cannot identify this thing, I'm still in the middle, can't make a decision. I would say carry on with the treatment. But if I know, it gives me a satisfaction that I can go along with these people. So this is my second thing that we're talking about. These are the pictures we tell you. You can see on the top left one, but one thing is highlighted, which is a PSM and PET scan. The other one, it does not light up. They both are PET scan, they're metabolic scan, but they're not specific to prostate cancer. If you can identify, I can target that area down by stereotype radio therapy, it's only one area. Now that, um, the paradigm is shifting. Previously, when people are diagnosed with advanced or metastatic disease, they were term, labeled as terminal. Now with advanced uh, treatment and technology, we can target only isolated area. And that some of the trials have shown they live longer without having any treatment. We're saving them from a lot of toxicity and giving the good quality of life. Even a year or two, if we can give them without toxicity, I think people who have seen these who has gone through this treatment or seen people going through this treatment, it makes a lot. So in conclusion, we require continued promotion and support for cancer care screening, expansion of cancer care services and facilities, increased research and innovation in cancer care, and we would urge everyone to provide support and funding in a timely manner. Before I go, I'm just gonna read out the last uh, few lines from this one that I used to say to my people with the help of some of the other people, it's not all mine. So with love and care, we pave the way to brighter, happier, healthier days by building clinics, one-stop shops. That'll catch the cancer before it pops. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite up uh, Marjorie Olson to speak on her, family member, uh, her family's experience with uh, dealing with cancer within the family. So. Marjorie? I'm going to talk about my sister, Sharon. I'm glad to see you all here. Sharon Olson was born on May 10th, 1962, and died August 5th, 2022. She was Lois and Roland Olson's daughter, sister to three brothers and three sisters. When Sharon found a lump in her armpit in 2017, her doctor sent her for a mammogram. It took two weeks to get in, which found nothing. In fact, the mammogram report stated that her breasts were extremely dense. There was no evidence of malignancy. There was no change compared to her mammogram from 2013, and the mammogram was grossly unremarkable. 
Density was not something that Sharon had heard of before. She did not know that it could hide cancer in a mammogram and that it increased her risk of breast cancer. If she had known about the risks of dense breasts, she could have advocated for an ultrasound in those years when the cancer was starting and before it spread to her lymph nodes. Regular screening mammograms would have served no purpose. They didn't show anything. The subsequent ultrasound the same day as her mammogram found a large tumor in her left breast and cancer in her lymph nodes. Biopsies, bone scans, MRI, CT scans built her schedule. Chemo, radiation therapy, and surgery became hurdles to overcome. Because of the demands of her profession as a teacher, she took sick leave during her treatment and eventually retired after 28 years of teaching. And so life resumed. She was cancer free. She moved to Weyburn to be near her parents to help and be helped. She bought a house with a dream art studio in it so she could paint. Her lar large canvases of the South Saskatchewan River from space were held in awe by her nieces and nephews. And her time was filled with taking courses from the University of Saskatchewan, encouraging and being encouraged by her church family, studying the stars and the planets in the sky and watching tennis. But her most enduring task was to know and promote and inform of the dangers of dense breasts. She hadn't known, she didn't want others to be in the same position as she had been. Her posts on Facebook often asked, do you know if you're dense? Sharon familiarized herself with the lack of direction from the Canadian Task Force of Preventive Medicine, who didn't advise warning women of their density or recommend ultrasounds unless there was a suspicion of cancer on the off chance it caused anxiety. This made her angry. How could a week or two of anxiety possibly compare to 64 plus weeks of treatment and then in the end, death? How could a task force override her right to be informed so she could take preventative action? In February of 2022, Sharon contracted COVID-19 and her health suffered. She, got, she had excruciating back pain and in her hips and eventually went to the hospital many times where she was given prescriptions for pain medication. The thought occurred to us that maybe the cancer had metastasized to her bones and in search of help, she traveled to the Regina General Hospital where she sat in emergency for over 48 hours before she was moved to a room. After many tests and scans, which could not pinpoint the cause of her pain, a scan was done of her head and there it was, a tumor that caused brain tissue to be squeezed out of the way with associated inflammation. We hoped the surgery would remove the tumor and relieve her worst pain symptoms, but it did not. Sharon was also having mobility issues, causing her legs to spasm, leading to falls. And because of this, it was evident to her oncologist that the breast cancer had metastasized to her brain and spread beyond the tumor to the lining around her brain and spinal column and that further treatment, although not denied, could not be counted on to help. We made plans for end of life care and her family gathered in love and support in this most painful time. Sharon's deepest hurt was the delay in providing necessary information about breast cancer to all so that they would know the true risks to their health and what to do about it. In the past, I've received those letters from the screening program for breast cancer and I'm grateful for the program as I'm sure it has helped many. I was told I have dense breasts, but not what it meant, not a hint of the heightened risk, nor a link to an informational website. I also could have had mammograms that were grossly, grossly unremarkable that let me think I was fine. The wording is now more strongly worded, but it is still easy to overlook when one doesn't have the understanding. I realize we need to be our own advocates, but we cannot advocate for something we don't know. And people's doctors, if indeed they have a primary care physician, cannot advocate for their patients if they are not informed of the risks their patients with dense breast face and understand the necessary screening that needs to be done. And that was what Sharon wanted, for women to know their risks. And in that she succeeded because information will be provided to women with dense breasts in the fall of 2023. But is it enough? We need to have 
more think more screening to start screening earlier at 40 years of age to advise every person of their breast density whether they are dense or not and what it means and how the density affects their risk so they too can share the knowledge what a mammogram can and cannot show and to include annual screening ultrasounds in addition to mammograms for people with dense breasts with your help our family knows that sharon's hope will come true that every person in Saskatchewan will be given every chance to find their cancer early. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marguerite, for such powerful words. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, a colleague of ours from Ontario. Uh, this is Jenny Dale. Jenny Dale is the co-founder and executive director of Dense Breast Canada. Uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2014 uh, and now works to advocate for breast cancer screening all across the country. Jenny, take it away. Thank you, Connie. Honorable members of the legislature and guests, it's a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you. I also want to thank the Canadian Cancer Survivor Network for the invite, the support, and the important policy work they do to help Canadians. As Connor mentioned, I'm the co-founder and executive director of Dense Breast Canada. I was diagnosed with breast cancer eight years ago. And six years ago, I learned that Canadian women were not being given potentially life-saving information about whether they had dense breasts, a risk factor for breast cancer. I co-founded Dense Breast Canada, a nonprofit education and advocacy group. We work closely with Canada's prominent breast cancer screening experts to promote optimal and equitable breast screening. We have dedicated volunteers across the country. And in 2018, we began advocating with Sharon Olson for better breast screening for the women in Saskatchewan. My heartfelt thanks to the Olson family for being here today. Our hearts go out to you. It is an honor to continue Sharon's work with you. Next slide, please. Today, I'll be speaking to you about some breast cancer screening practices in Saskatchewan, how Saskatchewan compares to other provinces, and what Saskatchewan can do to help women find breast cancer early. Next slide. Breast cancer screening has taken place for 30 years in Saskatchewan. It's the most diagnosed cancer in women in Saskatchewan, and it's the second leading cause of death. One in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. In 2020, about 170 women died from breast cancer. We know some deaths can be prevented if better screening practices are provided. Practices like screening in the 40s and providing additional screening for women with dense breasts. Next. As you heard with lung cancer, when breast cancer is detected and treated earlier, lives are saved and cancer can be treated less aggressively. That means better quality of life. Next, please. When it comes to breast cancer, survival heavily depends on the tumor size of diagnosis. Survival of early stage breast cancer at five years is 100%, but at stage four, it is only 22%. There is no cure for breast cancer, so our best chance the best chance we need uh, for survival is to find breast cancer early. Next slide, please. Another benefit of early detection is less aggressive therapy. That means less breast surgery, less armpit surgery, and the option to avoid chemotherapy. Next, please. What is identified by the Saskatchewan Breast Screening Program is the participation rate. At only 39% of eligible women this rate is well below the national target of 70% and about 10 to 25% below other provinces. Next. 17% of breast cancers occur in the 40s and these cancers are more aggressive. Currently Saskatchewan lags behind by beginning self-referral at age 50. They have committed to lowering the screening age to starting at 40 in 2024, 2025. And we very much look forward to that. Next slide. After all these years of Sharon's advocacy, 2018, all women can now access their breast density online in Saskatchewan through their My Sask Health record, if they know to check. It is expected that in fall 2023, a software update will be ready and all women will learn their breast density in their mammogram results letters that are mailed to them. At that time, Saskatchewan will join nine other provinces and territories. It's wonderful to see Saskatchewan providing density notification to all women. But as Sharon knew, it's not enough to just tell women their breast density. 
Women with dense breasts need more than a mammogram. Next slide, please. In Canada, mammography is the most widely available, cost-effective, quickest modality for the detection of breast cancer. However, it's well understood that mammograms, which are essentially x-rays, do not show all cancers. Dense breasts are the most common reason for cancers to be missed. That's why women with dense breasts need additional screening. Dense breasts make it harder for a radiologist to spot cancer on a mammogram. Both breast, dense breast tissue and cancer appear white on a mammogram. Dense tissue can mask a tumor. In women with dense breasts, cancers that are missed on mammograms are often detected in between. Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> In women with dense breasts, cancers that are missed on mammograms are often detected in between mammograms when a lump has grown big enough for a woman to feel. These are called interval cancers. They're larger, more advanced at time of diagnosis and have a poorer uh, prognosis. Women often need chemotherapy, radiation, possibly mastectomy. Women with dense breasts are 18 times more likely, with the densest breasts are 18 times more likely to have an interval cancer than women with the least dense breasts. There are ways to find cancer earlier in dense breasts, and that is by providing ultrasound or providing MRI to women with higher risk. Next slide. It's been known for decades, for about 30 years, from countless observational studies that ultrasound finds additional breast cancers that are missed on mammograms in women with dense breasts. In addition, a randomized control trial of screening ultrasound is underway in Japan. The cancers found with ultrasound are early stage, and women having ultrasound have half the rate of interval cancers. This is an accepted surrogate for mortality reduction. We don't need to wait the 10 to 20 years for this randomized controlled trial to be finished. We know the outcome. Women in Saskatchewan need supplemental screening like ultrasound, and those with even higher risk need MRI. Next slide. Treatment costs for advanced stage cancer have greatly increased. Currently, figures are used from 2007 by governments, and they estimate the cost of treating a woman with stage 4 breast cancer to be about $1,800. The preliminary figures show that treating one woman with stage 4 breast cancer in 2023 costs as close to $200 to $250,000. The Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and Experts are working to update the Oncosim model for 2023 costs. It will likely be seen that it is more cost effective to detect breast cancer early than to treat advanced stage breast cancer. Next slide. Saskatchewan, unfortunately, is lagging behind other jurisdictions in supplemental screening. Screening ultrasound for women with dense breasts is readily accessible in British Columbia and Alberta for women with both category C and D density, and it's covered by provincial health insurance. Prince Edward Island has committed to ultrasound for women with category D, and just two weeks ago in Ontario, they have published a report and a draft recommendation that supplemental screening be given to women with category D density. In Europe, based on new data and a randomized control trial, the European Society of Breast Imaging now recommends MRI every two to four years for all women in category D. Yet in Saskatchewan, even screening ultrasound is not easily accessible for women with dense breasts. According to a radiologist I spoke with, access is not standardized across the province. There's apparently only one clinic in Saskatoon that's providing supplemental screening. We are aware that there are resource issues Addressing staffing shortages of mammogram technologists and sonographers can promote accessibility. Next slide. So our recommendation is that offering supplemental screening to women with dense breasts will improve the early detection of breast cancer, reduce mortality, and reduce suffering related to breast cancer for the women in Saskatchewan and those who care about them. And that is what Sharon was fighting for. And that is what we continue to advocate for. We ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, presentation, Jenny. Uh, we would also just like to acknowledge the other members of the Olson household who have joined us today. Uh, unfortunately, Stephanie was not able to join us today, but we'd also like to acknowledge uh, Conrad Roland Olson, Laura Olson, Lois Olson, uh, Wilfred Olson, and Jeremy Mather, who have all made the trip to come and support uh, Marjorie at this time. So we'd just like to thank you very much for coming out.
So with that, uh, we are now wrapping up our presentations. Uh, we would like to say thank you to Dense Press Canada for joining us on this presentation. And we hope that they we work together again in the future, uh, potentially again in Regina once more. But for now, we're going to close with a quote from a cancer patient that uh, is a member of our community back in Ottawa, uh, Judy Lawson, who uh, is still alive as, uh, as of recent things. But uh, she states that being well-informed and engaged is an important part in the battle against cancer. Uh, we also say, however, that it is important that we work as hard as we possibly can to turn cancer patients into cancer survivors. The more survivors, the better. So with that, we now move uh, to the end of our presentation. Uh, if anyone would like to reach out to us after this, uh, following up with any further questions outside of this, uh, my colleague and I, uh, Lindsay, will be in town for the next few days. If anyone would like to meet in person, we'd very much appreciate any opportunity. Uh, but if you'd like to reach out or you know find out more, you can find us at the following addresses, uh, email at either uh, jmanthorne at survivornet.ca or info at survivornet.ca. Uh, our website is survivornet.ca, again, obviously. Uh, we have our blog, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook, we have a weekly newsletter if anyone would like to follow along, and we are also on Pinterest. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for coming out. And at this point, we will now open up the floor to any questions anyone might have. So once again, thank you everyone for coming out today. If I could just ask if any MLAs have any uh, questions, if you could just uh, state your name and your uh, writing, it would be most appreciated. We do have a bit of a relationship. We do have a bit of a relationship with Winston Nash. Kathy, can you unmute? Uh, Kathy, can you unmute? Thank you. <laughs> uh, we do have some dealings with uh, Lung Saskatchewan, but we are more focused on a general. Uh, overall federal policy going on a province by province basis. Long Saskatchewan obviously is very inwardly drilled on Saskatchewan and many of them, but we do interact on occasion. Okay. We can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear anybody. Oh. Sorry to interrupt. So, uh, I think it's, yeah. I'm just wondering about the kids that lung cancer diagnosis and the percentage of those in the history of helping. of
Connor, would it be possible for you to repeat the questions that are being asked? Uh, certainly. My apologies for that. Uh, do you mind if I just go back down the row again and uh, get the questions repeated again? So uh, from Emily Mowat originally? Uh, I just asked about the relationship of lung to scatching. Yes, yeah. and CCSN. And I asked uh, MLA, and at least the lab I had asked about um, uh, the percentages of those diagnosed with lung cancer that uh, were not smokers. So the percentage of lung cancer who are non-smokers, and yeah. finally, sorry, I apologize, sir. In really, it was just, is there any connection to vaping and lung cancer? Vaping and lung cancer, all right. Uh, did any MLAs have any other further questions? Then with that, I would like to thank you all so very much for coming out. Uh, thank you for being the inaugural part of our All-Party Cancer Caucus here in Saskatchewan. Uh, we are the Gay Cancer Survivor Network. We are working to connect uh, policymakers, uh, medical professionals, cancer patients and cancer uh, survivors all together, uh, all across the country. And once again, we would like to thank you for coming out and attending. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, the bar, the uh, drinks and food are still available at the back if anyone would like to grab a snack. Uh, we're at the end of all this. So once again, thank you very much. Candice, Jenny, thank you very much for coming out. All right. I am going to end this call. Thank you for both very much. Uh, we will be in touch with anything in the future. Jenny, I'll see you probably in a couple of weeks. Yes. Bye-bye.